So okay. hi, and welcome to Nurse Table Talk. Kathy and I are very happy that you're joining us today. Our topic is the 10 commandments that caregivers use when um, treating dementia uh, loved ones or not treating, I guess, care, caring for their loved ones with dementia. So there's 10 of them and we're going to go through them one at a time and talk about them a little bit. But by the end of today's video, you should have a better understanding on maybe how to use them and the right, you know, things that you might think about when talking to someone with dementia. So let's get started. So um, I'll start off, I guess, Kathy, the first one is agree. We always want to agree with, um, you know, someone, our loved one or friend or family member that may, that may have dementia. Yeah. So you don't want to use logic or try to argue back. Um, the person with dementia will likely agitate. Um, so leave your comments short and sweet. Uh, don't try to give them too much information. Um, or, or try to look like you're um, maybe even dismissing them or looking to start an argument. So all bad, just keep it super simple and always agree with them. Okay, that's good yeah. advice. So now we're on to number two, redirect. Yep. So yep. yeah, do not try, do not try to reason with, with people with dementia. And this is also true of people who have, um, anything, any cognitive deficit. So um, anything to do with like Parkinson's disease or any of the dementias, vascular dementia, traumatic brain injured people, people like that, you know, you just don't want to try to, um, you don't want to try to reason, you want to try to let them try it for themselves. Um, encourage them to do what they can. So like th the example that we always see that is a really great one is that does it really matter if the flowers are in the vase upside down? Um, so you just want to kind of leave things where they are um, and kind of go from there. Yeah. I love that example too. Yeah. I, I mean, you can flowers see in the vase. Yeah. That's a great Absolutely. example. Yeah. Okay. So number three, uh, mm -hmm distraction. You don't want to shame. You, you know, right. you want to use distraction. Right. The best way to be able to do that, and you'll notice as we go through these, they all kind of weave together. So one is not independent of the next. It's just, it's kind of like you're going based on what you're seeing your loved one or um, your, your patient or whoever it is to you kind of the, the behaviors that they're starting to demonstrate. So in this particular instance, you just want to very gently lead them to another activity, lead them to focus their attention somewhere else. Um, making somebody aware of the fact that they don't remember um, is likely to cause um, agitation. And remember, too, that you have to be able to enter someone else someone else's reality. They cannot come into your world anymore. They are where they are, and it's your job to go to them. So if you kind of look at it that way, it saves a lot of frustration and sort of trying to figure things out to just really simplify your approach. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Okay, so number four is reassure and not to lecture. Right. So if we think about basic human nature, we all have to realize that most ill behavior crankiness, agitation, bad mood, um, lashing out, all comes from a place of fear. It's a fear-based, um, it generates when we feel unsafe. Um, and so what our jobs, uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with people who can't really cognitively, they're not really um, aware of where they are and how things are going or, you know, whatever, that you really honestly just have to soothe them, you know, use gentle reassurance. Um, let them just kind of um, know that it's okay. You know, it's right. like if you, if you, if they're really, really off, it's okay. Just let them know it's okay. Um, you did good. You did great. The vase, the, the flowers in the vase just looks wonderful. Just leave it alone. 
Simple, yeah. simple. Yeah. Very good. That's a great example again with the flowers in the vase, Kathy. Yeah. So number five, halfway there, um, reminisce. Don't say using the words remember. Use, you know, just kind of reminisce yeah. with them. You want to use I statements. Like I recall planting flowers last week and then go on with that. Like the warm day, the description of how the air smelled, you know, the, the worms and the dirt, um, those kinds of things. Like it helps them to see a wonderful, peaceful, loving, safe place. And they'll likely go off on their own story, which might have absolutely nothing to do with flowers, worms, <laughs> earth, sun, but it's okay. You're just, yeah. you're leading them to a path, you know, they're going to have their own ideas of their own memories. And, and they're probably not even close to what you remember, but it's okay. Um, if, if you're going to be um, confused and disoriented, uh, it's our job to kind of help people stay peaceful about that. Yeah. So that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. It's good advice. Okay. Yeah. Number six, repeat and not, and don't say, I already told you that you, you know, you just realize you're going to have to have patience and you'll, you will repeat. Yeah. And, and again, these are not these 10 tips. They're not independent of each other. There is nothing more frustrating than dealing with a two-year-old who asks you, you know, over and over and over and over and over again, the same question. And it's, it's kind of, unfortunately, the same sort of situation when someone has um, a brain injury. Yeah. So again, you know, not, not reminding them that you told them 150 times, this is when you go back and you say, you know, you start a story about something else, or you give them a task to do, or you, help them to kind of refocus on something else. Because again, what we're trying to do, the number one um, glitch for all caregivers is, is that they, they don't have the tools. And these are wonderful tools to help people just kind of stay sane and take care of what needs to get done. So again, just diverting attention, um, trip down memory lane, if you will, those kinds of things all go a long way. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, number seven, you always want to let them know, do what you can, you know, and not say you can't do that, but do what you can. Yeah, like if we go back to the flowers in the vase, you know, praise. Okay, so they're upside down. It's okay. I mean, maybe that's just their perception of how they should go. And, and that's where it is. But we want to we want to give people the opportunity to express themselves, you know, nobody wants to sit in a corner all day and stare at a television set. And, right, and right. whether or not they're able to do things on their own, um, or, or need to have somebody who's with them all the time, you know, find things for them to do, you know, and praise them for them folding the laundry, polishing silverware, washing out the cups in the sink, brushing their teeth. Maybe they can still button their own clothing. And, you know, those kinds of things, we want to praise those things because that is a sense of accomplishment and purpose. And it means a lot. Right. And folding laundry can be something to that. They oh, might be absolutely. Into, you know? Absolutely. You bet. Oh, okay. So number eight, um, you want to ask and not command. Yeah, well, if you're taking care of a parent, it's likely that they birthed you and they've been putting up with you for quite some time. So part of respecting someone is to treat them that way all the time. So it does get a little frustrating. Um, but you want to, you want to keep things simple. Again, we keep going back to that, you know, um, you want to say, you know, mom, instead of saying, mom, what do you want for breakfast? Because that is a loaded gun. It could be anything from fruit loops to steak or anything in between. You have no idea. So yeah. you want to keep it really simple. Like, would you rather have oatmeal today? Or would you like a couple of eggs or, you know, dressing? Do you want to wear the blue pants? Or do you want to wear the brown pants? But it's about asking and leaving people with the sense of their own control over what they can still control, because that's, again, very, very important. And at the same time, keeping the world smaller and simple so that they can better easily navigate through that. Yeah, because too many choices can cause confusion. Yeah, and frustration. Absolutely. 
So absolutely. So yeah. number nine is encourage and praise. And we kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier. We're kind of weaving the different um, commandments together, but again. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for folding that laundry for me. Thank yeah. you so much for putting those flowers in that vase for me. It's, it's giving people, it's giving people a sense of autonomy and a sense of um, self-worth and um, that should never go away. So again, like Julie said, these all weave into each other um, because you are not always going, if they're not textbook. And sometimes you see things one way and some things, sometimes you see things another way, depending on where you are as the caregiver. Um, and so, yeah, we, we just want to make sure that we got it all covered. So everybody feels good about having to do what they need to do. Yep. Yeah. And finally, number 10 is to reinforce and not force. Yeah. So this one is really important out of the 10. I think that this is the one that really makes the biggest impact. So I use the example of routine. Um, the reason that routine is so important is because you have to remember people are not flexible anymore. Anyway, as we age, we kind of get set in our ways, right? So that's human nature. And then on top of it, when you're living in a world where you, your perception is not accurate, um, you're really, really depending on taking cues from your environment. So staying on a schedule ends up being how people accomplish that. There's also another syndrome called sundowners. And it's a time of day when a person who's got um, dementia or traumatic brain injury or has some cognitive issues, the chemicals in their brain start to shift, like the serotonin levels against the dopamine levels and all of those things. And it's real, but it seems to happen around four o'clock ish in the afternoon and last kind of till bedtime. And that's when they, that's why they call it some donors and people can get a little feisty. Um, it can manifest in a bunch of different ways, but it can be tantrum throwing. It can be resistance to care. It can be physical. It can be all of those things. So you want to do as much as you can in that person's world to sort of uh, maybe like uh, tamp that down. So um, same TV, same TV show, same record album, same bed clothes at the same time. And, and I'm telling you, I've had people put their loved ones into their pajamas at five o'clock because at 515 it starts and they can't wiggle their arms and their feet into PJs. So you got to kind of manipulate the environment to help it work for you. Um, but again, as much as you can do to keep everything the same will go a long way um, in promoting a sense of safety, security, and a little less escalation. And it helps them be happier. They're more comforted, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So. And at the end of this too, I really want, um, people think people don't understand the disease of dementia specifically, and it doesn't really matter what kind of dementia there is, but there is an actual scale. It's called the fast scale, F A S T scale. And it's a dementia scale. And as people move through the scale, um, they're less able to do things and it encompasses everything from feeding themselves, recalling three words in a row, if they're continent, if they're not continent. So the reason I bring that up is because that is kind of how a doctor or a care, a professional person can kind of judge where your loved one is in the disease process because we can't see inside their brain. So we're going to take it all from symptoms. So when you take your loved one to the doctor, if you're noticing things about mobility issues, swallowing issues, being able to button up a blouse or follow simple commands, anything that's different from the last time, you need to report those things to your physician or to your loved one's physician. It's very, very important information. Right. Because you know them best. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, yeah. 
So um, winding this up today and um, any last thoughts that you might have? Yeah, I think that, you know, when we look at when we look at our motive for or our mission for our channel, it's to save people time, save them money and to save their sanity um, with dealing with the health care system. And I think that I think that this goes a long way. Um, A lot of people are never given the tools on how to take care of somebody who's got these really intense needs. And they're just kind of like sent home after the diagnosis and they're kind of left to the post-it note and the reminders and all of these things. And, you know, and you can do, you can do very well for a long time and then things kind of shift. And so we really wanted to bring this information, this basic information to folks so that they knew like how they can get the most longevity from their effort. We want to thank everybody for tuning in today and we'll see you on our next topic. Have a great day. Bye. Like the content you just watched? Hit the like button or hit subscribe here. If you want to be notified of any future videos, please ring that bell. If there's any topic you'd like to see discussed, leave us a comment in the comment section. Nurse Table Talk. Save time, save money, be informed. Thanks for watching.